What are privacy layers? Why do we need privacy layers? And how are we going to get the privacy layers that people need? So first, let me state the why for privacy layers. Um, obviously, the reason why we need privacy is because we don't have it right now. Um, if you want to ether scan, every single transaction is public. Right? You're able to see the entire history of all the wallets. So the second reason why we need privacy is that if we want mainstream adoption of our blockchain technologies, we really need privacy, right? It's one of the main hurdles uh, alongside scalability and um, you know, identity and other issues. And finally, uh, I'd like to just quickly address on uh, you know, privacy and regulation issues. And there's effectively a spectrum of solutions, right, when you build a te te privacy technology, where on one side, you build fully self-sovereign uh, solutions where only the individual control their information and assets. And on the other side, you could give you know, a lot of control to the entity actually controlling this ecosystem uh, while preserving privacy between individuals. Uh, and so on the right side, you have something like CBDCs. On the left side, you have something like Tornado Cash, right? And perhaps actually in the middle, we'll have something uh, that's more or less um, maybe you know, best of both worlds where we could have a privacy preserving system, yet give some limited form of control to you know, some set of authorities. OK, so enough, enough on the why. Uh, let's talk about what I mean by privacy layers. Um, so uh, just to reiterate, everything on Ethereum is it's public. So you're able to see everything on EtherScan. And first, uh, what I want to define is the notion called anonymity. So anonymity is. Uh, the inability to tell who is doing a transaction, right? So if somehow you're going to Etherscan and you look at a transaction and you can't really tell who the address, you know, wh who's the initiating address, then we say that this system has anonymity. And second is the notion of confidentiality. If you go to Etherscan um, and you cannot see exactly what the trades are, then we say this system is confidential. And it turns out confidentiality is really, really hard on Ethereum. It's pretty much impossible until, uh, unless you want to redesign the entirety of Ethereum. Right. So um, on the other hand, anonymity is actually quite easy. Right. We can use any mixer to mix the funds, and you know, every single time we want to do an operation. However, this is very, very unusable. Right. To the extent that only, you know, we, only when you very much need this would you do such a thing, right? Normal users would not uh, do this for every single operation that would do on um, DeFi protocols. Um, so the goal is really to make this very usable, right? How do we get usable anonymity for Ethereum? So, um, so what do I mean by, again, so just to re reiterate, the system will have anonymity if you go to Etherscan and you cannot see uh, you know, who's initiating all, all these contract calls. Right? So the question is, can we get something like this with Ethereum? Right. Um, so, and you know, we, don't, we don't want uh, privacy uh, anonymity just for payments. We want this type of anonymity for any type of smart contract calls. So you can see, you know, on Ethereum, you can do many, many different things. Um, you know, it's, it's an ecosystem of dApps, not just payments, not just you know, peer-to-peer -peer swapping of assets, not just NFTs, it's whatever you can imagine on top of token standards, right? We want to have anonymity by default for all the apps. So that's the question. Um, um, and, th and that's also what I mean by a privacy layer. A privacy layer for Ethereum should have the following, um, you know, set of features, but let us look at um, what are the current solutions for privacy layers. Um, if you look at the entire ecosystem, we'll have many, many different EVM chains that's you know, more or less, uh, you, know, you can write a D app and go to you know, any, any of them. And we have many, many uh, applications, sometimes on one popular chain, sometimes on many chains. And what are the privacy solutions? Well, we have some mixers, and we have uh, you know, some solutions that offer some type of DeFi compatibility. And we have solutions that more or less act as a layer two and with privacy. 
So for instance, Aztec and Zika Opera are great examples of this. And on the other, other hand, we have also have alt privacy alt ones. Uh, and the examples are like, for, instance, for example, Alio uh, and Manta, where uh, you know, it's a separate chain, uh, it might be a different ecosystem, and you have to bootstrap all the liquidity. And so it turns out you know, there's no single solution that works with all the dApps. So if you look at what these solutions do, uh, so RailGuard and Zcopru actually only do support some limited form of swaps. And uh, projects like Asset Connect uh, allow, you know, actually pretty good different interoperability, but it's not completely compatible with every single dApp. Right? So for Asset Connect, you need to write a custom bridge contract. Uh, and in fact, you know, that's basically if you go to every single Aztec hackathon, like that's what people do. You know, they build bridge contract for every single dApp. Uh, you know, and that's not scalable if you want, to, want this to support every single DeFi projects out there. So uh, you know, this is our observation. We don't have a privacy solution that um, you know, is default and really usable. Right? So, um, so yeah, so let's look at um, what, what I mean by privacy layer and what sh we should get in this privacy layer. So first of all, it should be feature complete. Okay? So, uh, so what I mean by that, you should have two features. You should be able to use this you know, privacy layer exactly the same way you would use you know, Ethereum, right? So you should be able to use um, a privacy, privacy preserving solution on any D app that, that you want. Um, and, you, and, and ideally, you know, with basically the same interface, right? You go into, you go into a D app front end, you click some buttons, uh, and you, you, know, you do a swap. And second, um, you should be able to dis disclose what you have done. Okay, so if you look at you know, existing privacy solutions, it's actually really hard to tell someone else that you did something. Um, you know, the interface is not intuitive. Whereas right now, for the transparent solution, if you give someone your address, they know, you know, they can see your entire history, right? So we want some type of form of information disclosure, right? So if you own a set of NFTs, and you want to prove to your friends that, you know, I own this set of NFTs, and I authorize a message, uh, you can do that. You should be able to do that really, really easily, right? Um, OK. And the second thing you should, you should do is be backwards compatible, right? Because we'll have all this amazing ecosystem out there, all these apps that people use. Um, we don't want to you know, throw it out to waste and build something completely brand new. Right? We want to reuse the existing ecosystem. So the ecosystem should, be, should support ERC20, 721, 1155 standards. Um, and you know, we should more or less work with existing applications. And finally, most importantly, you should actually offer some form of privacy, which in this case, anonymity. Right? So recall back to the previous slides, um, you will be the form, you know, use this thing, and everybody will use this privacy layer, and you go on the Ether scan, no one can figure out who did what action. Right? So the question for my talk is, you know, can we build such a thing? And actually, the goal of my talk is to convince you that we could build such the privacy layer for Ethereum today. And we're building one. OK. So, so let's look at how we're going to do this. Right? So, um, so let's look at this you know, set of three things that we want for our privacy layer. And it, you know, if you kind of categorize them, the first uh, two, you know, two features are basically what a smart contract wallet gives you. Right? So if you're familiar with the kind of abstraction where you know, any type of smart contract wallet this is the two things that this should offer you, right? You should, you should be able to use it on any single application, and it's backwards compatible. And the second thing, second feature, that's, you know, it's really what a mixer offers you, right? What a uh, shorted pool gives you. So I realize, you know, some of you might not know what a shorted pool or, you know, mixer is. So let me just reintroduce the two, two concepts. So first of all, what is a shorted pool? A shorted pool allows you to unlink deposits and withdrawals, right? So this is the most basic form of privacy solution that you know, we've had since the Bitcoin days. Right? So it allows you, any user to deposit, and later on, you should be able to withdraw. But by the time that you withdraw, nobody else should know uh, who's actually withdrawing. Right? So you should withdraw to a fresh UA address. So that's the notion of a shorted pool, or mixer. And second, uh, let's recall the notion of a shorted, uh, uh, actually, no, this should say contract. Contract wallet. Uh, let's recall the notion of a contract wallet. What is a contract wallet? Well, for a contract wallet, the users actually don't, do not own a EOA anymore, right? So, for for instance, for account abstraction, uh, you will have different uh, address that we use, um, and you know, 
but basically, you know, for your, for your smart contract wallet, you should be able to do the exact same things that you would do with you know, your MetaMask, right? You should be able to submit arbitrary smart contract calls and get executed, right? And, and this is done in the form of an uh, intermediary uh, smart contract wallet that verifies some signature and carry out the calls for you. Okay, so that's the notion of a contract wallet. And recall what we want to do before, you know, we said that, you know, the, the thing we want to build is basically a shielded pool plus a smart contract wallet. So, so, so here's what we're actually going to do. We're going to take the two and just put them together. Okay? Um, so it's, it's going to be a shielded contract wallet. Right? So what, what can it do? You, you should be able to use anything uh, that is on Ethereum. And every single time you use the wallet, nobody should actually know who's actually using the wallet. Right? So the, there's one single shielded contract wallet that's shared by all the users in, in the ecosystem. Um, OK. So, so you know, that's on a very high level, but how does this actually work? Um, um, right. So for shielded pools, like, like we said before, it supports deposits and withdrawals. And for contract wallets, you'll support arbitrary calls. And when you put them together, you'll support, again, deposits and withdrawals, but, but also, crucially, something uh, that you, you can use to, to call any dApp. You know, DApp. All right. So, so here's the picture. Here's how it's going to work. Um, it's going to be a smart contract sitting on Ethereum, where it allows any, any user to you know, enter this ecosystem. And once they enter, they're able to use it as if it's you know, a MetaMask wallet. And when different users submit uh, transactions, they will you know, they'll be reflected on chain. So if you want to call Uniswap, you want to call OpenSea, um, you would, it should just work. And furthermore, on Etherscan, you have no idea who's actually behind the scene doing this operation. Right? And as a bonus, actually, we can make this um, smart contract or contract wallet compatible with account abstraction, or EIP 4337. OK. So uh, as it turns out, like, there's two problems you know, if you want to build this. If you want to build this, you know, just combine a shared pool with the um, smart contract wallet. The first problem is that when user submits a transaction that you know, contains arbitrary calls, you can actually just steal the funds of the entire contract. Right? Um, so here, if the user only owns, supposed to own one Ethereum in the pool, but it constructs a call you know, that consumes 20 Ethereum, um, you know, this is, we shouldn't let this happen, right? Because you know, um, people would be able to steal the ent entirety of the funds of the entire protocol. So uh, what's the solution? Well, the solution for this problem is that we actually just separate out the two contracts uh, into a contract that actually holds the, the, all the funds, what we call a vault contract, and a wallet contract, which will actually carry all the calls. Um, so in this way, users will unwrap the um, tokens that they have, and only the tokens that they have is uh, inside the wallet when they're executing a call. This is actually kind of uh, equivalent to the other way of doing it, which is you also have a router and have the um, wallet holding all the funds and putting the things into the router. So there's kind of two equivalent solutions to solve the same problem. Uh, and the second problem that if you, you know, if you were to do this, which I think is the main reason why we don't have these things before, you know, is that for this type of privacy-preserving shielded pools, you need to know the exact amount of tokens, uh, what is called, you know, that's encoded in a node, before um, you insert it into the protocol, right? So, so everything has to be known in advance. Whereas in DeFi protocols, you have no idea how much tokens you're getting back, right? So there's this uncertainty of the smart contract decides how much you get back. But traditionally, for shielded pools, uh, you know, everything has to be known in advance. Uh, and so that's, this is like, a, you know, one feature that we didn't, know, didn't really know how to do before. Um, and there's a solution for this, which is that um, we have this notion of refunding to anonymous address. Uh, so we have to be able to re-randomize addresses and refund to them. I realized I actually you know, basically sped through my uh, entire deck and, this, well, and, and the end of the talk. Um, so let's recap what have we learned in this talk. So first of all, privacy is really important. We do not have privacy on Ethereum. We need some type of privacy solution for Ethereum that's really usable before Ethereum can go mainstream. And a shielded contract wallet, combining a shielded pool and a contract wallet, is our best shot at this 
backwards compatible, feature complete, privacy layer. And finally, we're building this out. Um, we you know, hope to put something on the public, and, uh, and, and the hope is that you know, long term for this ecosystem, most people will actually be inside you know, a privacy layer instead of the standard UA layer. And if you're interested in contributing to this effort, uh, please come talk to me. And I realized I didn't do a soft introduction at the beginning. My name is Wei Dai, uh, a research partner at Bank Capital Crypto. And um, come ask me if you have more questions about this project. And I'll take any questions from here. Thank you. Hi. Uh, congrats for the work. I think privacy is very important. I've worked for a few years on having, trying to make users uh, have smart contract wallets by default. And the big problem is the gas cost. Of, of just having to onboard someone and already having to spend like $10, $5, sometimes $100. How do you think that that can be solved? Um, yeah, very good question. I think two things. Uh, one is the you know, actual cost of gas over time as we build the scalability layers should go down, right, as we build more rollups. Um, and the second is uh, we could use batching to um, Amortize the gas cost. So usually, you know, in, actually in 437, there's a notion of uh, bundlers and aggregators, where you know you compress the authentication information, uh, you know, from multiple transact from multiple transactions into into a single authorization for, for all the transactions, and you know, there's different tricks to kind of further optimize the gas cost. Uh, so over time, through these you know two avenues, the hope is that the the co additional cost incurred to to get a contract wallet with privacy. Uh, it's not prohibitive for, for users, for you know, for vast majority of users. Uh, great talk. I'm interested a bit how you think about uh, OFAC and Tornado Cash, um, because if this is like an opt-in, where's the coming from? Sorry. Hi, over here. Oh yeah. Hi. No, how you think about? Because uh, if you look at Tornado Cash and the OFAC sanctions, how do you think about sort of avoiding that kind of thing? With because my understanding is that this would be like an opt-in smart contract wallet. So how can you avoid that and kind of adverse selection and these types of things? Yeah. So. Um, so, referring back to my slides, where I showed the spectrum solutions, you, you know, I, I think as a builder, we should be flexible in kind of, so okay, what is privacy, right? Privacy is appropriate flow of information. I, I don't think privacy is an absolute notion where everything should be private to you. Uh, you know, there's, there's some societal, like, consensus on what is appropriate flow of information, right? And everybody can have their own interpretation of that, you know. Um, government agencies can have their own interpretation. Individuals in the Ethereum community can have, you know, you know our interpretation. Uh, and they might be incompatible. Um, but I think, as builders, we should be open to different versions of, you know, what is appropriate flow of information. Uh, because technology is, is really flexible. Um, and, you know, over time, there, should, there will be communities that might be incompatible, but like, you know, we should work towards a solution uh, that's more toward the center, I would say, where we include as many users into our ecosystem as possible, yet give some sort of control, perhaps, uh, maybe, to some set of people uh, to be able to prevent illicit activities. So when you say you're, uh, we're building this already, how far have you got? Uh, we have prototype contracts. You know, it's a very early stage. Um, uh, yeah, so the idea has been been there for you know a while, but um, the building is just just picking up traction, and um, you know we'll have basically two people full time on this. But, but why, why not embed these innovations into an existing contract wallet like Argent um, or something? So this well, there's many many different contract wallets out there with different focus. It, it's this is a contract wallet with, with privacy. Um, you know, it, I think it doesn't make sense to. Well, I mean, we could take existing, you know, for, we will take the existing 437, um, you know, standard uh, reference code base and just, you know, fit this into there. Um, the, the main difficulty is actually not being a contract wallet. It's really like how to add privacy, I think, because we need to also change the front end APIs. So, I mean, every single smart contract wallet have to do this, but like I think for, for privacy is more important because the, a lot of semantics need to change, right? So, if you think about how currently you pull balances, right, accounts, you first connect your wallet, you pull like, you know, 
what is connected wallet address, and you like go to the contract and, and pull, okay, what is our actual map balance? That cannot be made privacy preserving, right? Because you get who it is. So you have to change that into something like, you know, connect to wallets, can I get the USDC balance? Um, you know, so, so a lot of things to change uh, when something needs to be, you know, it's, you want to imagine a privacy preserving system. So we would love to co collaborate with, you know, uh, contract wallet projects. Uh, and that's also another, another reason why we're trying to stay compatible with 437, because we can reuse, uh, or, you know, have the same bundler infrastructure and this, you know, account of abstraction man pool. So we will be part of that ecosystem and contribute to that effort as well. Great talk, thanks. Uh, what kind of, uh, kind of zero-knowledge protocol you decided to use? Um, yeah, so, so, you know, as it turns out, the easiest way to prototype something like this is Circon still. Like, there's nothing better out there that you can, you know, try to zero on a circuit and have, like, Solidity verifier and, like, a, a, you know, a prover that's running in a browser. Circon is the only ecosystem. So this is, like, another rant. I would use, you know, the, like, most efficient proof system out there. Like, it probably more, like, Plunk, but it's, that tooling's not there. Um, and also, like, over time, it sounds like you're, you're familiar with this type of systems, but like over time, uh, there will be like kind of two separate proof systems, right? So one is on the user side, where you essentially want zero, zero knowledge property only for privacy. Uh, so you know what is this thing? It's, it's, it's a, I mean, the, the overall design is very similar to like any other shielded pool. You have a Merkle tree of nodes, right? Uh, you're referring to a node and spinning it without revealing which node you're you're, you're referring to, right? Um, and that for that you need zero knowledge to, to preserve your privacy. And you actually don't really need a succinctness. And we're going to have this like, aggregation layer that roll up these uh, user spending proofs. And for that, you really want succinctness, right? You want to be able to verify on the contracts that really efficiently, right? And so uh, you know, I think this, this is something that has been discussed a lot in DevCon uh, in the past couple of days, which is you have the notion of an inner proof and outer proof, right? So for us, this inner proof will basically be the user proof that has zero knowledge, right? We can use, I, I think over time, you know, which, uh, we'll probably evaluate things that's uh, really fast in the browser, as to your knowledge, and maybe some type of compression, you know, so like maybe Spartan or something. And then on the outer proof, we'll have, you know, probably gross testing or Plunk that really compresses the all, all the other proofs, right? Um, yeah. So one approach to solving this problem would be to make backwards compatible contracts on Ethereum. Other approaches might be to wait until there's an L2 that has more primitives built in that support this. And I'm just curious to learn more about your thinking of if it ever makes sense that privacy will be in one place and non-private things can exist in another. I think, yeah, so, yeah, the question is, you know, do we build privacy solutions on top of existing things or do we build a new ecosystem to build privacy preserving solutions. And I think the key question is, what are the privacy supported? And what is the features of those applications? And um, so, I, so it, it turns out that the short answer is, um, there's no privacy preserving ecosystem right now out there that actually support more features than anonymity. OK, so if you look at like Alio uh, or like Mina, it's really just a solution to build rollups. Like, you know, with, with zero knowledge, you cannot get privacy for shared states. So I, I actually discussed this in another talk of mine. So if you think about the, the features we can support, I, I think unless you have vastly more capabilities to support privacy preserving solutions, which I think is actually you know, privacy of shared states, um, it doesn't make sense to have a complete brand new ecosystem because the privacy that we, that's achievable is the same. Um, so there's no benefit to building a new ecosystem that do the same thing, right? So therefore, um, so if that's the case, we should build on top of existing ecosystems because everyone is there with desperately need privacy solutions and it's possible to build it. So, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel. Is it working? Yep. Uh, so it sounds like you need a sequencer for maintaining the Merkle tree. Have you got thoughts on yes. how you're going to decentralize that or whether you will? Yeah. So there's actually kind of two, two different things, right? So for 4337, you have the notion of bundlers. Um, and and I, we could basically use that. So we could actually, so bundlers, um, so I think it's yet to be determined exactly what's in the standards, but uh, it seems that for every single contract wallet, bundler needs to run custom code to be able to compress different user operations to one. Uh, so we could, 
essentially stay compatible to that standard when, you know, when it's more finalized to be able, you know, to, to, to have essentially to plug into that ecosystem, right? So there could be like different 437 bundlers that's supporting different smart contract wallets, and we'll be one of them. And in that, in, in that way, we can decentralize uh, bundling. And the second is, yeah, so exactly, so there might be this management of Merkle trees that's separate to man that com you know, compressing multiple user operation proofs into one. And we can make that permissionless, yeah, I, I think it's a current, current thinking, right? So, um, so, so what is the overall story? It, is that, so because we support, we're backwards compatible, right? We support the exact same set of operations. We, like, users need to pay more gas, right? It's like, that's the, you're paying the same amount of gas by default. Um, and the additional things, that's, you know, the overhead to, like, maintain everything. And th the idea is to, like, make it as small as possible. And the only way to do that is to uh, kind of outsource this aggr aggregated work into some sequence or bundler. So, so it's, it's basically necessary if you want to make this user usable. And so, yeah, so, you know, to decentralize, I think, you know, make it permissionless and really design incentives around this, right? That's because these are bundlers, sequencers are providing a service. Um, which will incentivize behavior and make it permissionless and design kind of this ecosystem that's self-sustainable, right? Uh, because, because I think like users will pay for privacy uh, if it's cheap enough and you can get this network effect, right? Um. Thank you so much, Wei.